episode of Equity Mates. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Bittersweet uh, beginning to the episode, because it's the last time I'll hear that in 2021. Yes. But And, you know, you built a reputation of perhaps not delivering that introduction flawlessly, <laughs> but this week you've been bang on every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So, bring, uh, well bring, done. Bring my A game for the it's last. It's taken a year, but we've got that. <laughs> but that, that's it. It is our, our final episode of the year. Uh, it's been a great year and we thank you all for joining us and no better way to close out than with uh, Roger Montgomery and uh, a look at what is happening in 2022. So for the final time, we're uh, welcoming Roger back. So Roger, welcome. Hey guys, really good to be with you to talk about this topic because, of course, we have no idea what is actually going to happen. <laughs> um, so, yeah. This could, is gonna, it could be a very short episode. It could though. be a very short episode. <laughs> if you are just joining for us for the first time this week, please go back and listen to uh, our episodes from Monday through to Wednesday. We've had Roger all week um, and uh, we've covered all things inflation. We've covered some of the key takeaways from AGM and reporting season. And then we snuck in four stocks on our on the watch list episode yesterday. So um, plenty of amazing content to close out the year. But Roger, as uh, as we said, we're here to talk about 2022 and we're not uh, going to sort of get the crystal ball out and say that this is absolutely going to happen. But what are some of the key thematics, key themes, key, key sort of movements in the markets that um, you're considering for next year? Okay, let me start by saying that Notwithstanding, there's, there, there is an ever-present risk of a 10 or 15% correction. You don't invest in the stock market without expecting that you could wake up in the morning and over the course of a month or even a few weeks, you could get a you know, 15% decline in, in the equity market. I think that's, that's always possible just on the basis of fear. But markets tend to correct seriously when something completely unexpected transpires. So it's when the market is surprised by something that you get a correction. Now, the market also and investors also tend to jump at a lot of shadows that never really eventuate, you know, think fears that never really you should have been concerned about. Uh, I think inflation is one of those. So a year ago, uh, I wrote an article in the Australian newspaper just to say, that I thought 21 would be, pardon me, a fantastic year for equities, uh, and it's turned out to be a great year. Um, I believe that 22 will also be a very good year for equities. Um, we may not see, you know, 20% plus returns, uh, but I still think it'll be a positive year. Um, it'll be important to pick the right companies, uh, but I think inflation concerns of today will give way to a celebration that lower interest rates are here to stay, um, that disinflation uh, is going to be um, uh, endemic uh, and, uh, and consequently it'll be a very, very good environment for stocks. If you go all the way back to 1978, you know, the case for innovative companies was, for investing in innovative companies, was always best made in an environment where interest rates were... Um, either declining or stable. Inflation was in a period of disinflation. Now, disinflation is not deflation. It doesn't mean prices are declining, but it means consecutive rates of inflation are lower than previously. So if this year in the US was 6.2% as of October, next October, if inflation is 4.5% or 5%, that's disinflation. And th that, if you get growth in the economy, along with disinflation, then that is the perfect environment for innovative companies, growth companies with pricing power. And so I think next year, those growth companies that have sold off because of inflation, um, those companies that have sold off because of fears of interest rates rising imminently, I think they will be bought aggressively again. And let's not, let's not forget that there's a lot of concerns that the market is expensive at the moment. If you look at the Cape Schiller ratio for the S&P 500, which is the Robert Schiller cyclically adjusted PE. It's at the second highest level it's been since 1870. And so people are constantly reminding me that with that PE at 38 times, uh, the market is frighteningly expensive. In fact, that level's only be ex been exceeded once 
and it was exceeded in 1999 during the first internet boom. Uh, and I was investing during that time. I was working at Merrill Lynch and then uh, the market collapsed uh, in April or March or April. It was around Easter time uh, of 2000. The difference between then and now is that 25% of the S&P 500 is made up of five or six stocks. You've got um, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft. You know, there are six companies there that uh, represent 25% of the S&P 500. And those six companies are generating returns on equity, the likes of which no one even in business school would have contemplated would be possible. And what I mean by that is, as these businesses get larger, as their equity base increases, as they generate profits and retain a large portion of those profits back to equity, they continue to not only grow their equity base, but they continue to increase the return on equity. It's like having, it's like having a bank account with $10 million in it, earning 5%. But when you grow that bank account to $100 million, you're earning 20%. And when you grow it to a billion dollars, you're earning 50%. And when you grow it to $5 billion, you're earning 60%. And these businesses are achieving higher rates of return on equity as they get bigger. So not only are they growing because their equity is growing, not only are they, is the, the base value of the entity growing, but they're becoming more profitable. Now, that is, that is something that we've just never seen in business before. You know, business is becoming more profitable. Not only are they the largest businesses in the world, but they are the most profitable businesses in the world. The only thing that's going to stop them is regulation, you know, antitrust type regulation. But in the absence of that, and I don't think the US is going to regulate them too harshly because then that would give advantage to Chinese competitors. And I don't think the US wants that. They don't want to hobble, hobble their own companies. And so, you know, yes, the market looks expensive, but let's not forget that it's being led by large businesses the likes of which in terms of profitability we've never seen before. Uh, and so that's one reason why I think even though the market is expensive, it can stay expensive. Yeah, it is fascinating, Roger, um, that those six companies and, and what they've been able to do, uh, it will have broken a lot of uh, Wall Street analyst models, uh, but we love to see it right. just, just continuing to go from strength to strength. Uh, but exactly. Roger, we, we, we started the week by talking about something uh, that the market believed that you thought that they pr were perhaps wrong about, and that was around the inflation discussion. Um, as we look forward to 2022, is there anything else you think the market believes that you think they're wrong about? At the moment, as we speak and as we conduct this interview, no, I think the market's sort of in a period of efficiency. I think it's it's it, you know there's no thematic out there that that, that we are talking about at our, at our investment committee meetings where we think the market's got it wrong. So for example, earlier in the year we thought the market was underestimating the power of the reopening, and then of course we went into lockdown again, uh, and so we thought the market's going to overreact to that, which they did, and we knew that the vaccination rates would start to accelerate, uh, and then we'd get back to a reopening stance. At the moment, we don't think that there's you know, the market's getting much wrong. The only thing I would say is that the market's too nervous about inflation. They probably don't need to be worried about inflation as much. And so back to the point that I made earlier in this interview, I do think that that will reinforce the argument for owning innovative companies and growth type businesses. And, you know, I think it was yesterday uh, that I talked about Macquarie Telecom. You know, that's a classic example of a business that's innovative. It's a growth company. It looks overpriced in an inflationary environment. It would probably be hit pretty hard in terms of its share price. But I don't believe that's something investors need to worry about. And so our argument that we think it's worth intrinsically over $100, that's more likely to be achieved over the next 10, 12 or 18 months because the market will be more relaxed about inflation. So, Roger, we've seen some pretty um, hot industries this year. We've seen hydrogen, uh, I mean, any, anything around sort of climate change and sustainability, uh, EVs. Um, are there any industries going into next year that you're going to be paying a little bit more particular attention to or that are really exciting you? Well, we think the metals that supply um, lithium-ion batteries, we believe that's a once-in-a-generation shift. 
Um, and it's not going away anytime soon. It's going to accelerate. We think the tipping point has already passed. In fact, I believe the tipping point was earlier this year when Volkswagen, I think it was in February or March, they presented their, their power day. They had a, a webinar, a global webinar. Webinar went for a couple of hours. You can Google it on YouTube. Uh, you can watch the interview. You know, that was transformative in terms of uh, a company spending something like or promising or committing to spend something like 42 billion euros on, on uh, development of an entire fleet of EV models, as well as a global network of fast charging stations. And most importantly, perhaps, um, you know, a, a, a series of plants that are dedicated to recycling lithium ion batteries. So that tipping point has been reached. And what we also know is jurisdictions all around the world are starting to mandate the sale of zero emission vehicles. So that trend is entrenched. It's not going away. Um, it's going to continue. And so, you know, lithium ion uh, batteries are going to be in hot demand. The raw materials, the upstream raw materials that are needed for that, including lithium and cobalt and copper and so on, um, all of those things are going to be uh, in demand. There'll be shortages of those products. And I think investors might be surprised just how, how high the prices of those particular commodities could go next year and the year after. It's not going away anytime soon. The share prices from time to time will get ahead of themselves. You know, uh, businesses like Pilbara and, and Oricobra and so on. And so you'll see their share prices fall. They'll be more volatile. And so you've got to put an appropriate amount of capital into them. But as I said earlier, we believe it's a once in a generation uh, shift. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a really important thematic. Uh, and it, we believe it's important to have some exposure to it. And so we've got a few percent of our uh, small companies portfolio exposed to that particular thematic. Yeah, very interesting, Roger. I'm sure a lot of uh, Australian mining investors that seem to love lithium will love to hear you say that. But look, we have uh, reached the end of our time. So we want to say a massive thank you for uh, joining us today and this week uh, for our final uh, few episodes of the year. Um, I just want to leave with this question. You know, you uh, for amongst, amongst many things that you're famous for, Roger, one is uh, your book, uh, Value Able, uh, which is a oh. cracking read if, uh, if people haven't read it. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Well positioned. <laughs> but I, I hey, guess... Guys. I've never done, I've never done it before. There it is. Good, a good plug. People are it, it's pretty hard to get your hands on, actually, Roger. Yeah. You might need to speak to your publishers about doing a reprint. We have so many people in our community who want to get their hands on a copy and they just can't find it. Yeah. So. Well, so, guys, we're doing... The, the, the guys at the office are doing a two-for-one offer for the book at the moment, so you can get one for yourself and one as a gift for Christmas for someone else. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you we'll... go. Well, direct all queries about the book to Roger's team, not to us here at Equity Mates. <laughs> uh, but um, look, Roger, what I want to ask is, uh, as well as your book, obviously, uh, if there are people who are looking you know, over the summer when they've got some downtime uh, for resources to uh, really you know, accelerate their learning and, and to really sort of uh, hit the ground running in 2022, feeling more knowledgeable about the world of finance and the world of investing. Are there any resources or any books that you would recommend they pick up uh, and get stuck into over the summer months? So I'll, 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 recommend, I'll recommend two. Um, and, and, and the reason why I'm going to recommend these two books is because I really think it's important that investors don't jump from fad to fad but develop a framework for investing that they, they stay within over the long term. Now, there are millions and millions of ways to make money in the stock market, um, but you have to form a framework and you have to stay in that framework and you have to keep applying that framework consistently over time. And then you'll go through periods of underperformance, but you'll go through periods of exceptional outperformance. Uh, that's what I've experienced. That's what our funds have experienced. Uh, you know, we're delighted that at the moment all our funds are outperforming. Um, and, and so I do believe that a framework is really important. So the first book I'll recommend, and I hope you'll forgive me, but I wrote Valuable. I wrote that book, which you can buy at rogermontgomery.com. I, I wrote that book for people to understand how to identify a really high-quality business and how to value a really high-quality business. I think they're the two most important lessons that you can learn about the stock market. What is the difference between a high quality company and a rubbish company? And it really comes down to something called return on equity and return on assets. 
And I spend a couple of chapters talking about how to measure that properly and how to feed that into a formula for calculating the intrinsic value of a company. The other book is more of a biography um, and it's by Roger Lowenstein and it's called The Making of an American Capitalist. I think it's the single best book, um, even better than um, a subsequent book called Snowball about Warren Buffett. Uh, I really enjoyed reading that book. I've read it multiple times. And I do believe what it will do is give investors, particularly new investors, a grounding in the fundamentals of investing in businesses as opposed to investing in stocks. You know, you can approach the stock market two ways. You can, you can pick stocks that go up or go down, but that's similar to betting on black or red, or you can buy pieces of businesses. And businesses increase their intrinsic value by retaining profits adding it on to the equity on the balance sheet, and then generating a high return on that new increased equity base. And if you continue to do that, over time, you increase the value of a company. Companies that can do that sustainably have a competitive advantage. And so what my book and what Roger Lowenstein's book, uh, The Making of an American Capitalist, uh, talk about is those quality businesses and the ability of those businesses to sustain or to create and sustain competitive advantages. So I recommend those two books for Christmas. Love it, Roger. If uh, you can flick us a link to those books, we'll put it in our discussion group for those in the Equimates community who are looking for a Chrissy present or have struggled to get their hands on a copy this year. But um, terrific. we uh, thank you so much for your time, not only on uh, this long form over the last week, but uh, for all the support and um, valuable insight that you've given to the Equimates community over this year. And um, we certainly look forward to uh, picking it up and touching base with you again next year, I'm sh which I'm sure we will. So um, have a great holiday and thank you so much for your time. Guys, it's been great supporting you. It's been great being part of your journey as well. And uh, I wish everyone a safe, uh, peaceful and, uh, and joyful Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of another uh, episode of Equity Mates and to the end of our year here at AusBiz. It's been uh, an awesome year. We've covered so much content. So much. It's uh, hard to even recall. Um, but look, we certainly appreciate all the support that you've uh, given us on the Equity Mates and AusBiz channel, all the support that you've given across the podcast, the book launch. There's just been so much going on in Equity Mates Media. And a big thank you to AusBiz as well for giving us the opportunity to. Put, uh, test our feet in digital streaming. Yeah, yeah. Get our faces out from behind a microphone <laughs> and in front of a camera. Uh, and if you, like Bryce, are struggling to recall everything that we've covered this year, <laughs> the good news is wherever you're watching this, on YouTube, on the Ausbiz website, you now have two months to go back and watch every episode from 2021. So, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, enjoy that and uh, we'll see you in 2022.